The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. From now through the end of the year, we're inviting you to actively participate in our living legacy as we commemorate the past, celebrate the present, and commission the future of Hour of Power. Our Eastgate Legacy Walk will transport guests through the first 50 years of our broadcast and into the next as they enter the Shepherd's Grove Presbyterian Church campus from the east side. Featuring 12 pillars flanked by plaques that tell the story of our journey and 500 stones engraved with the names of those who support the ministry, we believe the Eastgate Project will inspire hope for future generations. Today, we're offering you a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to become part of this unique tribute to God's faithfulness. For your generous donation of $1,000 or more, we will honor you by inscribing a 12 by 24 inch stone to be inlaid in the walkway that features your name or the name of your family, the year you began watching Hour of Power, where you're from, and the flag of the country from which you watch. Your participation in this special memorial not only marks your vital role in the ongoing outreach of Hour of Power, but it positions us to begin our second half century of ministry from a place of financial strength that will prime us for even greater impact in the years to come. Thank you for being an important part of our legacy. And remember always, God loves you, and so do we. For those of you who are here, or wherever you are, I want to invite you to stand up with us. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. And we're going to say this together. Would you say this with me? I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. Well, today we are finishing a series called Remember the Quarry. And today I want to finish talking about this idea of a standing stone. That all of us are building memorials. We're doing our best to build things and to do things in our life, no matter how young we are, how old we are. Many of us have this unconscious need to be remembered. And the need to be remembered is a symbol of my life mattered. My life made a difference. My life had an impact. It's interesting because in Israel, if you were to go on a tour, there was in the 90s the discovery of a, 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 a space called Tel Gezer. Now, if you go to Israel or any place in the ancient world, it's very interesting when you go to deserts and plains, you'll have a flat plain, you know, grassland or a flat desert, just sand everywhere. And then out of nowhere, seemingly, you'll have a 50, 60, 70 foot hill that looks like a, like a zit on the face of the land. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Why is this thing sticking out? And those hills are called tells. And so one of these tells that they were excavating in, in Israel, they found a bunch of these standing stones. Bring that picture up one more time for me. These, are, these standing stones, some of them, the ones in this picture are not quite this big, but these are sometimes uh, 20 or 30 feet high. These particular stones are 5,000 years old from the early Bronze Era. And what happened was when a great feat was accomplished in the ancient world, they would bring in these stones and then stand them up so that when people came, they would say, what happened here? And the reason I begin there is we're going to talk more in the scriptures about standing stones. But in general, you see throughout history, people trying to put up things to kind of reinforce this idea. See, my life mattered. See, I did something important. All I'm pointing to is, a, is an inner desire that we all have to show that the effort or the accomplishment that we had is worth remembering. And I want to tell you that the, 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 many of the things that the modern world will tell you is worth living for, is worth attaining, it's not worth it. In fact, some of it is worthless. Some of it is even garbage. But to live your life completely for the Lord, to live your life for your family, for your kids or your spouse, your marriage, to live your life for your hurting neighbors, 
to even live your life, to encourage your enemies, to turn to what is good. Man, that is a life worth living. That is worth getting up in the morning for. When you live your life for others and for the Lord, people will tell your story for you. You won't have to put up a stone. You won't have to put up a statue. They'll remember what you did and it will matter. And maybe some of you here are saying, it's too late for me. You know, I've, I've done too many rotten things or I'm too old or I'm too this or that. It's never too late. If you're alive, God has a reason and a purpose ahead of you. And my hope today is that we can begin every day. It's like, it's like um, hygiene. It's like brushing our teeth. That every day we must recalibrate and remember that all these things that the world says are important, many of them just don't matter. But the things that scripture points to are important. Those are the things. When we get to the end of our life, these are going to be the things that really matter. And it's never too late for you. And I want to encourage you. Choose today to chase after the Lord. And choose today to chase after the people that really matter in your life. I know you already are doing it. Some of you I want to encourage you to keep doing that. So our world, you know, they have all these accolades and awards. And, and, and all of them are fun. I mean, I love sports. You know, it's super enjoyable. And I love looking at the, those things. But... The, the, the great artists of the world and the, the, the great athletes of the world, the great business titans of the world and achievers and writers, how many of them at the, at the loftiest point of their career, when they have all the money in the world and all the glory and have achieved everything, how many of them must we hear say, it's worthless, I got all this stuff and it didn't matter and now I don't know what to do with my life. How many times do we have to hear that story until we believe them, until we learn from their mistakes, until we learn that all those, those things are fun and they're interesting and it's okay to pursue those things, that there's something better that all of us can attain and we don't need to be wealthy and famous, that there is this thing that Christ offers us, that the Lord offers us when we follow him, that we can live a life worth living by living for one person, not a million. When we live for the one or two people or sometimes ten people that God's called us to, we're doing what is good and right and something that will be remembered. It will be remembered here, but even more importantly, it will remember, be remembered in heaven and God won't forget it. And he won't forget you. So all these accolades we have. I remember when I was, uh, when I was a kid, you know, in, you know, elementary school, junior high, I had a Nintendo Entertainment System, the original Gangster, 8 bits. It was very solid. One of my favorite games was Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! And uh, this was a boxing game, and you start out as this, I think it's, you're supposed to be Rocky Balboa, you're like this tiny guy with like, you know, and, and he, he has to kind of go up the chain of boxing, and you have to beat, you know, all these different guys like Glass Jaw Joe and different people, and when you finally get to the last guy, it's this giant, hulking Mike Tyson. Then you have to beat Mike Tyson. And to, to be honest with you, I'm ashamed to say that in my entire life, I was never able to beat Mike Tyson on Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Maybe one of these days I'll get an old Nintendo and I'll, I'll figure it out. But as silly as this sounds, when you're a kid, these things get emblazoned on your mind. And because of that, I started watching boxing with my Uncle Jeff, who was a huge boxing fan. Whenever there was a big match, he would always get the pay-per-view thing and invite the family over, and we would watch all these matches. And I remember multiple times seeing Mike Tyson fight and just thinking, whoa. I remember one time, I think it was 37 seconds after the event began, the event was over. And I thought, wow, that was a lot of money for just a little bit of entertainment. At least the barbecue's good. Mike Tyson is considered one of the greatest boxers of all time, second probably to only Muhammad Ali. I don't know a ton about boxing, but I know he was the youngest boxer ever to attain a heavyweight title. He won his first 19 fights, and 12 of them were absolute knockouts. He's the first guy to get a WBA, WBC, and IBF title at the same time. And when, when he was winning, he was the Michael Jordan of boxing, just one of the greatest athletes anyone had ever seen. And it was so funny because years later, I was watching the news and I forget passing by, and I saw the story, and it, I've never forgotten it. Watch this. Look at this stuff. This is history here. Mm. You, are, you are history. This is garbage. I can say, hey, I bled for garbage. <laughs> So this is meaningless. No, at one time it meant a lot. When you're just a young kid, this is everything to you. But then you realize your priorities change. 
and you just want your children to be happy and do nice things, and that makes you happy. This is nothing. This is just nothing, man. Isn't that powerful? I bled for garbage. And he flips the title belt with contempt. I bled for garbage. And let's not try and pursue lives like that. I mean, I, boxing is great and sports are great. I think sports are especially really good for kids. And I think winning and learning to win and play on a team, all of that is commendable and useful and helpful. But at the end of the day, and maybe this is an American thing too, we're just so obsessed with winning at, at things sometimes that don't matter and we lose at the things that really matter. I want to invite uh, Pastor Russ Jacobson to come up. I've told Russ's story before, about a year ago, but I'd like for him to just share the story real quick. And uh, I remember meeting Russ at our church, and as I got to know Russ better, I found out, man, Russ is this, you know, pretty successful, you know, uh, running a, an accounting firm that has some pretty impressive clients. And, and yet I noticed that as busy and successful as he was, like he always put the church first and he always put especially his family first. And if you, if you know a family guy, I guarantee the best he's going to get is equal to Russ. I mean, Russ <laughs> is like, has three kids and he and his amazing wife, Deanna, do such a great job with their family. They're always going on trips. They're always doing things together as a family. They love the Lord as a family. They, and I just, I just enjoy Russ so much. And I remember him telling a story as to how he came to a place when these priorities sort of got straight. And Russ, I just would love for you to share that story. Yeah, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I was the chaplain at a senior living facility, a very nice senior living uh, facility. And um, they basically had three phases there. One was their independent living, and the second was sort of um, an apartment which was supervised, and then they had the skilled uh, you know, care facility. And so I remember just being there and meeting some people there and um, just being amazed by how their lives had shrunk over time. And when you just see how people have these huge jobs and these huge houses, and these massive responsibilities and these important things that they had accomplished just like that. And you'd get them at the end and it really didn't mean anything to them. So I remember one person in particular had been the chancellor of a university here in Southern California. I remember wanting to ask him, you know, what was that like to run a university? It's like running a small city. And you know, it, he just wasn't interested in chatting about it. You know, it just didn't mean anything to him at that point. And um, he just was alone. And then on the other side, the flip side, there were people who had been involved in churches. They were elders. Um, they went to church. They read their scripture. They had active prayer lives. And those were the people who did very well there. They had um, activities and relationships, and they were involved in things outside themselves. And those people thrived there. And so uh, you talk about what that looks like. You know, friends, no matter what you've accumulated or accomplished or gathered, in your life over time, whatever the accomplishments, eventually you're gonna come down to this one room that can't hold a lot of stuff and it can't hold a lot of memories. So I was basically faced with option A or option B, kind of like a, a Christmas carol, you know, a glimpse of the future, which do you want? And for me, it was I wanted to invest in my family, I wanted to invest in my children, I wanted to invest in those relationships because when you come down to it, those are the things that really matter. Russ, thank you so much. Let's yeah. give him a hand. We appreciate you, sir. And, you know, it, 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 and, it, and some of us don't have kids or some of us aren't married, and that's okay because at the end of the day, there are still key relationships in our life where we can make a big impact. Today is a new day. We can forget what was behind. And maybe you've made a bunch of mistakes. Maybe you've ruined a bunch of relationships. It's never too late to turn your heart to the Lord and to commit with Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's interesting how things like funerals can help us recalibrate and do some hygiene in terms of our priorities. Recently, we had a very a good friend of our family, great friend of my dad's, who's only 55 years old, very, very successful man, very wealthy man, had been born in a wealthy family, was wealthy his whole life, and uh, seemed healthy to me. And at 55, in the middle of the night, he like, went downstairs to get a glass of water, and he had a heart attack, and he died. And so we had this funeral, and all these people came out. And it was a very high-class gathering, a mix of 
some wealthy elite people from Orange County, a lot of that type of person, some of them really good people, and other people like from church or from the school. His son was my daughter's age, they were classmates at school. And it was interesting to hear people from different parts of this man's life. Some, and it was, this is what was weird, is when I listened to these different speeches, it almost sounded like each one was painting a different picture of the same person. None of them contradicted each other. They just seemed to highlight the things almost that like mattered to them. So like one of the early guys, I'm sure he's a great person, a nice person, but it was interesting because everything he talked about with his friend who had passed away was all the fun stuff he did, you know, boats and, and this type of thing. And when I heard it, it sounded sort of sad to me in a way. Do you know what I, what I mean by that? And I didn't feel sad for my friend who died. I felt sad for the guy who was saying it. It's almost like he didn't know that the other stuff that this guy had done was, was more, more important. My dad was invited to speak, and the widow was invited to speak, and other pastors was invited to speak. And what they said was what, what mattered. He's a great father, that he gave generously to organizations that needed him. I, what I remember about this guy is he just loved kids. I remember he'd have this golf cart and he'd drive around the neighborhood on Halloween and we'd have like 10 kids hanging off, which I love stuff like that. And they're all having fun and they're eating candy and he's like, yeah, you know, and like, that's the stuff I think that, that anyone can be and anyone can do. And that is the stuff that matters. And I, I just still remember too that my dad and the pastor, they both talked about his faith and his commitment to his family. And they especially gave an invitation for people to receive the Lord. And I thought that was such a good thing to do, such a good thing to do. All of this to say that your life is a standing stone. It's a standing stone. That your life is either going to point to the achievements that the world thinks is important, you know, wealth and success and titles, and those things are important, or it's gonna to point to the things that are more important than that that you invested in people, that you sought after God with all your heart, that you made a decision to turn your back on the gods of this world and turn your heart completely to Him and to live for Him with all your heart and with all your soul. And I promise you, friend, if you only have a day left to live and you make that decision today, you'll be glad that you lived at least one day well. These are the days that matter the days we live for the Lord, and the days we live for others. I believe you're living your life well for others. Keep doing it. Keep pressing in towards him and pressing in for your family. So I'll just end with this. The Bible is full of these standing stones. When Jacob saw the Lord ascending and descending in angels on, on, the, on the hill that's called Bethel, he was so struck that he put up one of these stones and said, Lord, I'll never forget. And when somebody comes by here, they'll call this place Bethel, the house of God, because God came to this place. When Moses was giving, given the Ten Commandments, he was so struck by it that he put up 12 standing stones, one for each tribe of Israel, and said that when people come by here and they ask, what are these stones about? He'll say, the Lord was in this place. And he gave us 10 commandments for how to be and how to live rightly. When Joshua crossed the Jordan River and he carried with him the ark, he put up the standing stones. And they said, we will never forget that God carried us from a faraway land into this promised land and gave us this place. And actually, Joshua is a great place to finish. You know, Joshua, when he arrives in the promised land, he, he sort of enters in a younger man and he finishes a very old man and a lot happens between them. Fighting and difficulty and rebellion and, and people wanting to turn their hearts to other gods. And finally, at the very end of Joshua, he begins to divvy out the land to these various tribes and set all the rules and boundaries for where they're going to be and how they're going to live. And then finally, Joshua gives this speech. He takes them up on a hill and he reminds them that God brought their father Abraham out of a distant land and that Abraham left his, the gods of his father Terah and embraced the Lord Almighty with all his heart. 
And that God brought the people out of Egypt and that many turned their hearts back to Egypt. But some who were there left and turned their hearts against those gods and came to this place, this promised land, this gift, where heaven would be reigned and hell would be boxed out. And he gives them this speech. He says, after all of that and all the vacillating that we as a people have done of looking to Egypt and looking here, looking to the, the pagan gods of our fathers or looking to Yahweh, Joshua finally says, enough! Enough! Make a decision today! Enough! He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestor worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day, today, whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then the people cry out and they say, we will serve the Lord. And what's hilarious is Joshua looks back and he goes, no, you won't. <laughs> Imagine I did that. Imagine I gave an altar call and I said, who wants to come? And come before a bunch of people came down. I was like, no, nah, you're not going to. I can tell. Go back. Go back to your seat. I can just tell. Joshua says, no, you won't. You won't serve the Lord. You'll continue to go back and forth. And they say, far be it from us. We will. We will serve the Lord. And he said, he's like, are you sure? They're like, yes, we will serve the Lord. And then he says, fine, fine. We'll make a decision. You'll serve the Lord. And he says, yield your hearts completely to the Lord. And they say, we will. And then he says, all right, I'll put up one more standing stone, this gigantic stone. Poof. And he says, let this be a testimony against us if we ever turn our hearts to other gods and turn our hearts away from the Lord. And they say, amen. Let it be so for us. May we never turn our hearts from the Lord. May we never turn our heart from what matters. May we love the Lord with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength. May we love our neighbor as we love ourselves and continue to pour out daily as much as we can for him and for them. If we do that, if you do that, your life will be a true standing stone. One that will matter. One that will make a difference. One that will alter history. One that when you get to heaven, you'll recognize and notice, man, I'm so glad I made that decision. You will. Just a couple of things before I end. Two things I want you to do today. If you really want to live a life for God, you really want to live a life for the people that matter, the first thing I want you to change is this, your calendar. I know it seems simple and silly, but life isn't changed by big monumental leaps. Life is changed by daily, every day, making small changes making decisions today that I won't be distracted by other things. What we do in our personal life, Hannah and I have a date day every Monday. If you want a better marriage, get a date day on the calendar. I, uh, I hang out with Haven and get breakfast with her every Wednesday. And when Disneyland was open, I would take Cohen to Disneyland every Saturday, and I still try and take him on little walks on Saturdays and stuff. Put it on the calendar. Doesn't mean that's gonna be the only thing that you're gonna do, but at least you'll do that. Make a commitment to a church. Go every week. Why would you skip? It's a great experience. Make a commitment to, to go to church and to be with God's people. Give one hour to the Lord per week. It doesn't mean that's the only thing you do, but make a commitment to do that. Put it on your calendar. Get lunch with your friends afterwards. It'll be a good experience. If you hate your church, find a new church. Why are you sticking in a church you don't like? Get, find a great church. I know all of you will stay here, but you know, I'm talking about other churches. Yeah, our church is awesome. So if you want to change your life, change your calendar. I mean that. Second thing, if you are not a person of faith, you don't know how much longer you're going to live. Make a decision today. You don't have to come down to an altar call. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to raise your hand. All you have to do is what I did. 
is even quietly in your seat, just decide, just decide. Today, I choose the Lord. As for me and my house, we choose the Lord. We turn our back on all these other things, and I choose the Lord. I choose the Lord. Choose him today, and you won't regret it. You'll be grateful when you come to the end of your life that standing by your side is Jesus Christ, the great advocate, who will stand with you and say, let this guy in. You'll be grateful that he's there with you. Let's pray. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that as your disciples, flawed, distracted, hurting, some of us have illness, some of us have things that keep us up at night, in spite of all of that, we believe that we can have lives worth living if we live according to your word. Teach us, Father, what it means to love what is good and hate what is evil and to know the difference and to live our lives completely for you and not for garbage. Help us to live completely for you, we pray. Father, we love you with all our heart, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Believe it or not, Christmas is just around the corner. And today, Hour of Power continues the tradition of offering a unique holiday ornament. Handcrafted from solid brass, then overlaid with 24 karat gold, this beautiful filigree angel lifts her hands to heaven in praise and adoration. Stamped with the Hour of Power 50th Anniversary logo on the back, she is the first of five in a series, was made entirely in the U.S., and is yours with a generous gift of $20 or more. To further light up your winter and remind you of the true meaning of Christmas, we're excited to offer the ornament and our Silent Night Nativity Snow Globe for a generous donation of $150 or more. Turn on the battery-operated light to illuminate the scene and place it in your home as a source of inspiration throughout the holidays. Inside this golden ornament-shaped lantern, Mary and Joseph look over baby Jesus, who is surrounded by swirling, glittery snow. This unique collectible is a wonderful way to usher in the season, while also keeping this hour of power on the air, not only in your home, but in homes everywhere. Call, write, or go online and request the 2020 Angel Ornament for your gift of $20 or for your gift of $150 or more. We'll also include the Silent Night Nativity Snow Globe. Because of you, Hour of Power has been proclaiming the hope of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, for 50 years. In this turbulent, weird time, we have the awesome privilege of sharing good news about the one who is unchanging and in whose love hurting and broken people can anchor their souls. By supporting this ministry, you've enabled millions around the world to hear the message of the gospel, and we are so, so grateful. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.